What if somebody had only one sin? He said, that'd be pretty good. Only have one. Why, we'd be in great shape if we only had one sin. Well, I suppose to some degree that's true. But you know, sometimes even one sin has big consequences. We tend to excuse ourselves and justify ourselves and uh, by saying, well, we don't do very many bad things. Not too many sins. I'm okay, just a few little sins here and there. Well, let's think about the results of even one sin. Take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Romans chapter 5. I realize that nobody has just one sin, but uh, even one sin can have big consequences. Romans chapter 5, look with me at verse 12. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. God says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. One man brought sin. By one sin he brought sin into this world, and sin and death spread to take over to all men. Go down to verse 18, the same chapter. Chapter 5, verse 18. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men to justification of life. One man sinned, and condemnation came upon all. And verse 19. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Notice, one man's disobedience many became sinners. It all started out back there in the garden, Adam and Eve. They were without sin. They were sinless. They had never committed a single sin. Now, I don't know how long they continued in that state after they were created, whether it was hours or days or months or years, I don't know. The Bible doesn't really say. But for a time, they were without sin. And they didn't have many rules to go by. Just take care of the garden. That was their job. And don't eat of the fruit of that tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, they had plenty of good things to eat. Uh, there were every fruit uh, tree you can imagine growing in the garden, I'm sure. Uh, plums and apples and pears and pineapples and orange trees, banana trees, cherry trees, oh, anything you could think of. And they could eat of any of those trees any time, and the fruit was all perfect, no, uh, no worms, no blight, no bad spots in it you had to cut off. You know, it was all just perfect and there, uh, accessible to them. They could eat any of it any time and enjoy it all but they had that one restriction don't eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil now some people say that was an apple that they weren't supposed to eat i don't think that's the case at all uh no basis for that in the scripture and uh, i don't think there's any fruit like that fruit on that tree in the world today and it hasn't been uh, for a long time uh, but i don't know what kind of fruit it was but Satan deceived them. He convinced Eve that this fruit was good to eat and it would make them wise and they would be like God to know the difference between good and evil and all those things sounded like good and wonderful things. And he convinced them it was okay. And so they disobeyed God. They ate and it was sin. Now what happened? Because of that one sin. One wrong thing that they had done. One instance when they had disobeyed God. What was the result? They lost their sinless condition. They lost their perfect fellowship with God. They brought the curse upon nature, thorns and thistles and weeds and all those kind of things. They were sentenced to die. They brought the sinful nature 
which they passed on to billions of people and all of that and billions of people sinners because of that and all because of just one sin now you say well why is that uh, they only did one little thing it was no big deal I mean what's the big deal just taking one piece of fruit and eating that and they only did it one time but they transgressed the commandment of a holy God they would broken God's law they had not believed God's word. They had transgressed God's commandments. And that sin brought condemnation upon them and all the human race. It brought a sinful nature to all the rest of the human race. Only one sin. But it had tremendous consequences. And you might say that every sin that ever has been committed is a descendant of that one sin. Think of the consequences. That one sin from it, that one act of in disobedience. Oh, so many things happened. And let's think a little bit about the consequences of just one sin. First of all, just one sin makes us a lawbreaker. One sin makes you a lawbreaker. Turn with me to the book of James chapter 2. James chapter 2. Verses 10 and 11. James 1, uh, 2 verse 10. The apostle says. For whosoever shall keep the whole law. And yet offend in one point. He is guilty of all. For he that said do not commit adultery. Said also do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery. But if thou kill. Thou art become a transgressor of the law. God's law is a unit. And when you break any part of it. You've broken the law like a chain you might hang a big weight on a chain but if there's one link in that chain that breaks everything falls even though only one link broke and when we sin it's not that just we've done this or that we just told a liar we just coveted no the reality is we broke the law of God we broke the law of a holy God we are lawbreakers we've broken God's law now, if you were to go to a prison and visit the people there, they would have many reasons for being there. Uh, maybe some were murderers, some bank robbers, some arsonists, uh, some extortioners, oh, all sorts of different things. But in reality, they all had the same problem. They broke the law. The thief broke the law. The murderer broke the law. Uh, the extortionist broke the law. And they were all there in the same prison. Broken different parts of the law, but they were all lawbreakers. And that's our problem. We all have broken God's law. You and I are lawbreakers in the presence of a holy God. Whether you've done this sin or that sin or some other sin is not the real picture. We are sinners. We've broken God's law. We stand before him as lawbreakers. One sin makes you a lawbreaker. Secondly, just one sin brings condemnation. Just one sin brings condemnation. Turn back to the Roman, book of Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3 verse 19. We read, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. And down to verse 23 it says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everyone is a sinner, and every sin means we are condemned by a holy God. Now, in olden days, not too many years ago, uh, if you would murder someone, the penalty of the law was death. And it didn't make any difference whether you murdered, I mean, as far as the penalty, whether you murdered one person or 25. You would still be sentenced to death. 
Now I realize that doesn't happen nowadays, uh, but in those days it did. And it wasn't the number of people that you'd murdered, it's the fact that you committed murder. And both the person who murdered one person and the person who murdered 25 would both suffer the same penalty. They were condemned to death. Now we are all sinners. And we are all condemned. Whatever sin we may have committed, how many sins we may have committed, how many times we may have done it, we're sinners. All have sinned and come short, don't measure up to God's holy standard. The wages of sin is death, whether it's this sin, that sin, or some other sin. We are separated from God in spiritual death, sentenced to eternal death, because we have sinned. And even if we had only committed one sin, we would still be condemned. Now I know we've committed many more than that. Every day we sin. But even if we'd only committed one sin, we would be condemned. Because we have broken the laws of a holy God. Just one sin condemns us. A third fact. Just one sin can ruin our usefulness. Just one sin can ruin our usefulness. Take your Bibles and turn back to Second, Corin Second Chronicles chapter 26. Second Chronicles chapter 26. Let me introduce you to an old king named King Uzziah. King Uzziah was a great king of Judah. In fact, he was one of the best, one of the greatest, longest reigns, a great king. Second Chronicles chapter 26, verse 3, it says, 16 years old was Uzziah when he began to reign, and he reigned fifty and two years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Jechaliah of Jerusalem. Verse 4. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah did. He was a good man. He did right. He tried to live uprightly. He tried to follow God's laws. Verse 5. He sought God in the days of Zechariah who had understanding in the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord God, God made him to prosper. Oh, there was that preacher Zechariah and Uzziah listened to him and listened to the word of God that he spoke. He believed the word of God. He tried to follow it. Uh, he was a good man. He defeated the enemies all around. Uh, he built a great army. Uh, he brought peace and prosperity to the land of Judah. He invented engines for throwing stones and shooting arrows. And he was famous among all the nations. I mean, he was a good king. Notice in chapter 26, verse 16, this sad commentary. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord his God and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. Now the job of the priest was every day to go into the temple and burn incense and pray and offer that incense and other sacrifices before the Lord. That was the priest's job on a daily basis. And Uzziah, he wanted to do that. He thought that would be neat. Why couldn't he go in and burn incense like the priest did? He wasn't a priest. He wasn't of the priestly tribe. His job was to be the king, not the priest. And the priest's job was to burn the incense and not be the king. And uh, yet he wanted to do that. And so he decided he would do that. And he got a censer, that little thing, he put the incense on and he put coals on. And he walked into the temple and he was <clears throat> going to offer that incense before the Lord. He just thought maybe it would be good for his uh, politics, you know, good, uh, good image for the people to see the king offering incense. Why, that would be neat, wouldn't it? And uh, the priest came running, they saw him and said, Uzziah, it's not for you to offer incense, that's the job of the priests. And you could say, well, what's the big deal? What difference does it make who offers the incense? It's incense, all the same stuff. Coals, all the same coals. All the same altar, all the same place, all the same prayers. 
Uh, what difference does it make who does it, whether the priest do it or once in a while the king would do it? Why does it make so much difference? Why should God be so picky? Well, it wasn't right, that's all. It was contrary to God's law. And the priest said, uh, Uzziah, don't you trespass. And he was angry with those priests. Who do they think they were to oppose the king? And it says the priests, as they looked at him, all of a sudden their jaws dropped. They saw something he didn't see. They saw his forehead was turning white. And the white was spreading across his body. That was a sign in those days of leprosy. Only this was spreading just like that before their very eyes. And when Uzziah saw what was happening, he himself realized, I better get out of here. And he turned around and left the temple, rushed out, and they hurried him out. Notice chapter 26, verse 21. And Uzziah the king was a leper unto the day of his death. And dwelt in a several house, being a leper. For he was cut off from the house of the Lord. And Jotham his son was over the king's house, judging the people of the land. He couldn't live in the palace anymore. He couldn't go to the temple and worship anymore. He couldn't continue his duties as king. His son had to take that over. And his usefulness was ruined. He died as a leper. Because of just that one sin. How many are there in this country today who used to be preachers of the gospel and are no more because they fell into sin? How many men are there, women, who used to be on the mission field and they're not there anymore because of some sin? How many used to teach a Sunday school class or witness or serve as deacon or something and no more because of sin? Oh, sin maybe is just one thing. Maybe it's just one incident, one act, one wrong thing that a person has done. It ruins their usefulness for God. Oh, don't let sin rob you of your usefulness to God. I notice also that just one sin can bring awful consequences. Just one sin can bring awful consequences. After David was installed as king and settled in his house in Jerusalem, he thought he ought to bring the ark up from the place where it had been for many years and bring it up to Jerusalem. And he discussed that with his leaders and advisors. They said, yes, that's a good thing. That's where the ark ought to be in the capital so people can worship there. And so he said, we'll bring the ark back to Jerusalem. Now, according to the books, the laws, the ark was to be carried by the priest. It had little rings in the corners of it so they could put a pole through there and four priests put the pole on their shoulder and carry the ark. That's the way it was supposed to be. But, you know, it was hot that day. And it was a long ways, a good many miles. And uh, that would be a long ways for those priests to carry that ark. And for most of the journey, anyway, we could just put it on a cart. And that would be easier, faster, more efficient, and safer, probably. And so they put the ark on a cart and brought the ark down the road toward Jerusalem. And two priests, Yusa and Ohio, were in charge. And as they went along the way, one of the oxen stumbled, uh, fell in a rut or something, tripped, and uh, shook the cart. And it looked like the cart was going to tip over and the ark was going to fall off. And uh, why that shouldn't be, we had to keep that from happening. And so, uh, so Yusa put his hand out to steady the ark, keep it from falling. And God smote him dead. Now you say, it sounds like God was overreacting to me. All he was trying to do was to be helpful. But it was sin. It was wrong. They were doing the right thing, but they were doing it the wrong way, and God was displeased with them doing it the wrong way. And just that one sin had an awful consequence, and Yusa lost his life. You remember Achan, 
same principle. City of Jericho being captured. All of the goods of that city were supposed to be dedicated to the Lord. That was the first city. But Achan saw those, that wedge of gold and those sacks of silver, those fine garments, and he took just that one time, took it and stole it, hid it in his tent. He'd never done anything like that before, I don't think. He was a good man. He had a good reputation. He was an important man in the army, an important man in Israel, had a good a testimony of all those around him. But he did wrong. And because of that sin, when they went to battle at Ai, they lost the battle and a number of the soldiers were killed. And then it was determined, God showed them, that it was Achan. And Achan and his family who participated in his sin, they were taken out and stoned to death. Awful consequences. One sin. Let me also suggest that just one sin can ruin your testimony. Just one sin can ruin your testimony. Turn to the book of 2 Samuel chapter 12. Second Samuel chapter 12 verse 14. David had sinned, took Bathsheba, another man's wife, committed adultery. And this is what the prophet said. 2 Samuel 12, verse 14, said to David, How be it, because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that's born unto thee shall surely die. David, you've done something and all the enemies of the Lord, all the nations around you can laugh and ridicule and make fun of you and your God. Now all the nations knew that David was supposed to be a man who loved God. David was a man who served God. David was a man who did right. He had that reputation. But now he takes another man's wife, commits adultery, and his testimony was ruined. The name of God was ridiculed. David's testimony was ridiculed because of his sin. And too often, unbelievers see some sin in our life. And they're always looking for one, you know. See some sin in our life or see some Christian fall into sin and their testimony is ruined and the unbelievers say, well, if that's the way Christians live, I don't want to be one. One sin can ruin your testimony. One sin has all kinds of consequences. Now, don't misunderstand me. Not every sin has serious outward consequences. Now, all sins are serious. All sins have consequences. They'll hinder your blessings, hinder your prayers, hinder your fellowship, hinder your testimony and service to God. So there's always consequences from sin. But they're not always big outward consequences. If you commit some sin, you will probably not get leprosy and die, you know. Probably no outward consequence like that. And it's not every sin that ruins your usefulness. It's not every sin that will ruin your testimony. It's not every sin that will bring awful consequences. And we all sin daily. And none of those awful outward things happen. But they might. You never know. Use the space shuttle as an example. Huge project. Can you imagine? Thousands of people work on that for thousands and hundreds of thousands of hours. There are people who do the planning and the engineering and the designing and the building and the testing. And in all that long process, there are hundreds of mistakes that are made and then found and corrected and so all goes on. But sometimes one mistake slips by. There's disaster. Years back, there was that spaceship and the O-rings failed. Just a little rubber part failed. The whole thing was destroyed. Or more recently, just a little piece of insulation wasn't secure enough and the mission was lost. Oh, there are many mistakes that don't have big outward consequences, but you never know. Sin is the same way. 
Don't let sins slip by. Don't continue in sins. Don't tolerate sins because you never know when some little sin is going to result in disaster. If you decide to tolerate some sin, you decide to continue in some sin, you say, oh, that's not that important. It doesn't matter. It won't make any difference. You make a wrong choice. And a wrong choice can lead to disaster. A few weeks ago, I was driving down Dempster Street. And all of a sudden in front of me, there was a little squirrel. Now, I always try and slow down and avoid the small animals, big animals too for that matter. Uh, but uh, uh, I, uh, I always slow down for them, try to get out of the road. But this little squirrel, I didn't see him coming. He just came all of a sudden. There he was, right, just right in front of the car, dashing across. And he made it to the center line. And then he said, I shouldn't be out here. And he turned around and went back. That was a fatal mistake. And uh, nothing I could do about it, but his career as squirrel was ended. Big mistake. Um, recently up in Minnesota, heard of a woman was conducting an estate sale. Somebody had passed away and they were selling all this old man's stuff. And there were a bunch of duck decoys there. Now in this part of the world you don't know anything about duck decoys. Uh, but uh, that's what you use to trick real ducks to coming in and sit by your fake ducks and then you shoot them. Uh, sounds like kind of a cruel trick, but anyway, that's the way they do it. And uh, when I talk about duck decoys, not talking about these plastic ones you buy down at Walmart or somewhere, not that. No, back in the olden days, in the long nights of Minnesota, when it gets dark about four o'clock in the afternoon, there's not much going on. The men, hunters, would sit long evenings whittling out ducks to use as decoys. They would whittle them out in great detail. They would paint them just so. And uh, they'd be some quite works of art. And they would use them to decoy the ducks in uh, during duck hunting season. And uh, there were a number of these decoys left in this old man's estate for the sale. And this woman didn't realize that, uh, you know, duck decoys nowadays in northern Minnesota, they are quite a collector's item. If you have a sack full of those, you've got a fortune. Uh, but she didn't know anything about that. And these old duck toys, they, they look pretty tacky and kind of grimy. And so she went to the store and got a nice can of paint and painted them all nice and pretty. And those decoys who would have been worth many hundreds of dollars were worth nothing. Bad decision with bad results. Well, every time we decide to tolerate sin in our life, it's a bad decision. And we never know what the results are going to be. And we need to get out of the habit of just excusing sins, uh, allowing sins, tolerating sins, enjoying sins, putting up with sins. Uh, we need to have the courage to face sins and call sin, sin. Uh, realize that gossip is sin and pornography is sin and trashy TV is sin and using the Lord's name in vain saying oh God every time you turn around is sin and jealousy is sin and dishonesty is sin and stealing uh, God's tithe is sin and gambling is sin and not paying your debts is sin and any number of things uh, sins are sins oh yeah we say we know they're wrong but we rationalize everybody does it Everybody commits some sins. Nobody knows I'm doing it. It's just a little sin. I just did that thing once, or I don't do it very often. Nobody's perfect, and we tolerate some sin. And somewhere along the line, eventually, one of those sins brings disaster. May ruin your home. May ruin your testimony. May ruin your service to God. May ruin your usefulness. Certainly it will hinder God's blessings. Oh, don't minimize sin. Don't overlook one little sin. Find those sins by the help of God's Holy Spirit and root them out of our lives and fight them and get rid of them and deal with them and confess them to God and ask His help in overcoming them. Don't let sin, even one sin, bring disaster to your life. Shall we bow in prayer? And as we bow in prayer, 
What about your heart and your life? You've been hiding some little sins there, ignoring them, making excuses for them, saying, well, they're not too bad. I can get by with it. I've been doing it for a long time. It doesn't matter. Listen, God wants you to deal with those sins. God wants you to bless you more abundantly, to pour out more blessings upon you. How can he do that if you're going to hide those sins in the corner of your heart? The face of sins. Say, yes, Lord, that thing is sin. I need to get rid of it. I confess it's sin, and I want to deal with that sin. Turn from that sin. Repent of it. Well, is there things in your life you need to deal with today? It doesn't matter if they're little or big. God knows that's not the point. What's our attitude about that sin in our life? Are we willing to seek it and to find it and fight it and get rid of it? Confess it to God. Are there sins in your life today that you need to deal with? You know it. You need to deal with it. And you just ask God's grace to help you to deal with that sin this morning. Heads are bowed and eyes closed, but would you just recognize that? Be willing to recognize to God, yes, Lord, there's things in my life I need to fight. I need to get rid of. Pray for me, Pastor. I want to deal with that sin. Would you just raise your hand, put it down? Yes, are there are others. Lord bless you. Others? Sins you're hiding, sins you're overlooking, sins you're not facing up to. Ready to do something about them? Anyone else? Father, we thank you for your grace. Lord, we know you hate sin, but we know you love the sinner. Your forgiveness is always there if we come and take it. If we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive it and us those sins and then to cleanse us from all that unrighteousness. Take those sins out of our life. Too often we want forgiveness, but we want to hang on to the sins. Lord, show us the foolishness of that. And bless each one who has a concern, Lord. Help them to just to turn from those sins, little or big, doesn't matter, and root those things out of their life by your grace. Your Holy Spirit might daily show us those things that aren't right and give us the strength and willingness to deal with them, that we might be a holy people because we serve a holy God. So, Lord, help us to fight the battle with sin daily and deal with sin as you show us those sins that we need to deal with. So bless each one. Give you grace, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.